Our scripture today comes from Matthew 1, verses 18 through 23. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through the prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Marlene. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1 as we move into week number 4 of our Advent series that I've entitled Christmas Unwrapped, Simple Truths Behind the Birth of Christ. And we are looking uh, at the individual stories, the individual accounts of the birth of Christ, and what is contained within them is reasons for uh, being joyful at this time of year. And so you can see uh, where we have been the last few weeks. We started off at week number one, and we talked about why we need Christmas, the importance of Christmas, and what it means for our eternal hope and our salvation, as well as our hope for our lives here on earth. Week number two, we looked at what we can learn from Mary and her obedience and her attitude uh, towards God. And last week, we talked about the shepherds. What could we learn from them? And we uh, looked at three different responses that they model for us to the good news. We saw that we need to make sure that we don't let fear define our lives. Secondly, that we seek God wherever we are. And thirdly, that we seek to live out a contagious faith. Our one-sentence sermon last week was that the proper response to the good news puts fear in its proper place, continues to look for God at work, and shares the light with others. And so we move on through the story today, and we move from the Gospel of Luke to the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, we've talked about the differences in style and type of books that we have been moving through. We started with the epistle of 1 John, and we learned that an epistle is actually a letter that was sent to a particular group of people and was passed around to the different churches to give them encouragement, to give them instruction, to give them correction. Then the last two weeks we moved to the Gospel of Luke, which we know was written by a Gentile. It was written to give an accurate, historical, scientific account to the Gentile people, especially the Greeks and the Romans, who would be very focused on facts and would be very prone to write off the Christ account as just another myth that was celebrated within their culture. And so today, our passage comes from the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew was written a little bit later than the Gospel of Luke. It was about 70 years after Christ's resurrection, so people had been waiting for an entire lifetime, essentially, for these promises to be fulfilled. It was written by a man by the name of Levi, who was also known as Matthew. Uh, we know uh, that Levi was Jewish. We know that because of his name, uh, he probably came from the tribe of Levi, which meant, meant that he was raised to be a priest. He was supposed to be a priest because that was what his family uh, work was. And so uh, we know that at some point he failed. It was a very rigorous process going through uh, the weeding out and the educational attainment and the demonstration of competence. And not everybody made it into the priesthood. And so we can surmise from his name that uh, he did not do that. He was not able to accomplish that. And so we can see that maybe in pain, he did the worst thing that any Jew could do under the Roman rule, which is instead of becoming a priest, he chose to become a tax collector, an enemy of his own people. And yet we see when Jesus is calling his disciples, he goes to Levi, this publican, this tax collector, this person who has walked away from his faith. And he says, come and follow me. And so Levi becomes Matthew, he transforms from a tax collector to a disciple. 
Why did Matthew write this gospel? It is essentially to tie the story of Christ's birth to the Old Testament prophecies that many of the Jews who were listening to these accounts would recall. And what they are saying is, this Christ, this baby that was born in the manger to a virgin, to a man named Joseph, is the promised and long-awaited Messiah. He is the King of the Jews. He is the fulfillment of all God's prophecies. Chuck Swindoll puts it this way. He says, Do you ever feel as though God has deserted you or that he sits in silence in the face of your requests? As we read through the pages of Matthew, not only do we see Jesus Christ revealed as Israel's King and Messiah, but his coming to earth as God in the flesh reminds us of his deep love for us. Our foundational thought this morning is we look at the story of Joseph is that God calls all of us into deeper relationship with him. God is constantly challenging us. Follow me farther. Come with me deeper into this journey that I have for you. And that always requires greater courage than what we have at our disposal at the time. Tim Keller, in reflecting on this passage in Matthew chapter 1, says that there is a one trait necessary demonstrated here for having a personal relationship with Jesus. And it's one that Christians in Western society are likely to overlook. An intimate relationship with Jesus always requires courage. And so we're, as we look for what we can learn from Joseph this morning, we're going to see that he demonstrates for us three different types of courage that we all will need to show if we want to be faithful followers of Christ. Number one, the courage to be disdained. Number two, the courage to give up my way. And number three, the courage to acknowledge our sin. Our one-sentence sermon this morning is that the courage to follow Christ more closely requires our focus to move from self-preservation to sanctification. So we begin with the courage to be disdained. We're told uh, that Joseph is engaged to this woman named Mary. In their culture, uh, this betrothal was essentially uh, everything involved in marriage except for two things, and that is living in the same house and consummating the marriage. Uh, and so they were legally tied to one another. They were agreeing to be faithful to one another. And the only thing that they were really waiting on at this point was for the groom to have a home prepared to take the bride to. And so sometimes betrothals lasted a year. Sometimes they could last longer, depending on how long it took for the man to get his financial house in order. But we know that in the meantime, during this betrothal, when they're committed to one another, and Mary's one job is to remain a virgin until that night after their wedding when uh, her husband uh, consummates that marriage with her, she comes to him and says, hey, guess what? I'm pregnant, and it's from God. And so uh, Joseph, as we can imagine, was not happy about this. And as we can also imagine, he was having a hard time believing this story. Joseph was within his rights in Hebrew law to not only have Mary publicly disgraced, to put her out there and say, something's wrong with Mary, she broke the contract, but also he could have her stoned to death. Uh, this was not a good situation for Mary. And so we're told something very important about Joseph here. Now, despite what he had the right to do, despite his anger and bewilderment, we're told that he was a righteous man and he did not want to disgrace her publicly. In 1958, a psychologist by the name of Lawrence Kohlberg uh, did a very in-depth study, very long-term study of the moral development of adults. Uh, he was building on the work of Jean Piaget, who studied moral development in children, and Kohlberg wondered, I wonder what happens to people as they get older. And so he copied much of the methodology that Piaget used uh, in that he made up these stories that contained moral dilemmas, and he would present those stories to adults and then he would ask them some questions. And so the one he used the most often was the story of a man named Hans. And Hans was happily married to his wife, and they had a very good life together. And then one day, his wife went to the doctor, and the doctor let Hans and his wife know that she had a very rare form of cancer, and that uh, she was going to die very soon if she did not receive treatment. But he had good news. And the good news was there's this medication. There's this new medication, and if your wife will just take it, then the cancer will be cured everything will be fine and you can go on with their lives. But as with most things in life, there's a catch, and that is that the medicine is extremely expensive, and Hans is not a wealthy man. And so Hans begins to go around, and he begins to gather 
all of his assets and he sells everything that he has and he still only has about half the money necessary to buy the medication that would save his wife's life. And so Hans goes to the bank and he says, can you please loan me the other half and I will pay you back. And the banker says, no, can't make a loan like that to you. And so Hans in desperation goes to the pharmacy and he begs the pharmacist, give me the medication. I can pay you half now and I will pay out the rest of it as soon as I can. And the pharmacist turns him away. And so in desperation that night, Hans goes and he breaks into the pharmacy and steals the medication that saves his wife's life. So the question that Colbert would then ask is, did Hans do the right thing or the wrong thing? And how did you arrive at that conclusion? And what Colbert discovered was that adults move through these three different progressively more complex, progressively more mature ways of deciding what is right and what is wrong. The lowest level is something he calls pre-conventional morality. And in this scenario, uh, he says that good and bad are determined by punishment and reward. So somebody in the pre-conventional stage of moral development would say, Hans was wrong because he's going to get caught, he's going to get arrested, he's going to go to jail. Bad things will happen to him because of what he did. Other people, he said, move past pre-conventional morality and they move to conventional morality. He says here, good and bad are determined by society or by societal standards. And so people here might say Hans was wrong because people will look at him and say Hans is the thief. Hans is untrustworthy. Hans is no longer a good person. But finally, he said about 5% of the population moved to this last level, this highest level of reasoning, which he called post-conventional morality. Here at this stage, good and bad are based on individual rights and on social justice. And so people in this stage would not only say Hans wasn't wrong, Hans was right. Hans was right because somebody should have helped him out. This is life and death. He did everything he could and it wasn't enough. And so it was within his rights to steal that medication. And Colbert said that this is so complex and it's so difficult to do that only about 5% of the population ever reaches this level of morality. Colbert noted this, he said, most people take their moral views from those around them and only a minority think through ethical principles for themselves. We see uh, Joseph is a unique man. There's a reason why God chose Joseph and that is because Joseph moved all the way through from pre-conventional to conventional to post-conventional morality. The decision that he makes about what to do with Mary shows post-conventional thought. How do we know this? Well, we know this because it says that he's a righteous man. The word in the Greek here, dikaios, means just in the eyes of God. It means fair. It means in conformity with what is really, truly ethical and good. Not what feels good to me, not what other people are going to applaud, but what is the right thing to do. One of the things we have to come to grips with if we are going to be the kind of person that Joseph was is that God doesn't always do things the way we want him to do. Jesus talks about this in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 45. He says God gives his sunlight to both evil and to the good. And he sends the rain on the just, on the dikaios, the people who are doing what they're supposed to do, and also on the people who are unjust, those who are not doing what they are supposed to do. Life is not fair. Just because you do the right things doesn't mean you're always going to have good outcomes. And that's where courage comes in. William Barclay says that dikaios is defined as one who gives both to men and to God what is due to them, regardless of what other people think, regardless of whether we are rewarded the way that we think we should be, we do the right thing. You see, Joseph's example reminds us that the approval of others and short-term outcomes are not to be the basis for our decisions. God's intent for the good of all, not just the good of those who follow him now. And that's a great disservice that I think we have done in evangelical circles is creating this illusion that if you say yes to Jesus, you move into this category where only good things will happen to you and where bad things will happen to all these other horrible people over here. But the reality, if you look at the gospel story, if you look at the thread of redemption that goes throughout the scriptures, is that God is always looking for that one lost sheep. God is always looking for that lost and hurting person to bring them back into the fold. Martin Luther King very famously puts it this way. He says, my obligation is to do the right thing. The rest is in God's hands. How do we do that? How do we slide into and stay in 
that particular mindset. Well, uh, it's described to us in 1 John 2.15. It says very simply, you can't love the world. Do not love this world or the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father within you. Our first key point is that courage begins with the answer to the question of who are we most concerned with pleasing. Once we settle that core issue, the fear of disdain loses its power. So Joseph illustrates the courage to be disdained. Secondly, he illustrates the courage to give up my way. The angel appears to Joseph and says, Go ahead and take Mary as your wife. She will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus. Probably about 10 years ago, now a video went viral of a little boy named Mateo. You can see him there on the screen. Some of you have seen the video, and it's of his mom videoing him arguing with her. And uh, when you set up the video, what's happened is that Mateo has been staying at Grandma and Grandpa's, and it's a little bit before dinner. He wants cupcakes, and he asks his mom, can I have a cupcake? And mom says no. And so he goes and asks grandpa. And so mom is telling him, Mateo, that's not okay. And Mateo bows up to her. If you see the video, and it's, it's really funny. I, I would play it for you, but we don't have time for that this morning. And he puts his little fists on his hips, and he says, he says, Linda, honey, listen to me. Look at, look at, listen to me. I can have a cupcake whenever I want one. This is grandma's house, and Grandma gets to decide what happens. And she's like, no, I'm the mommy. You're the little boy. You have to do what I said. And he's like, no, 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 Linda, honey. That's not how it works. And, and he just keeps back-talking her and sassing her and, and going along and trying to talk his way out of the problem. This is an illustration of something that Eric Erickson says can happen in child development, which is as they're developing this normal and healthy sense of autonomy or I can make my own decisions, I can do things for myself, Somewhere around the age of two or three, they can also move to where they have too much autonomy, autonomy, where we let kids do too much and make too many decisions on their own, and they become impulsive. They see themselves as little gods, and it's like, if it pops into my head, it's a great idea. Uh, if I think it would be a great idea to get out the carving knives and play with them, then that's what I'm going to do. And if I think it would be a great idea to do like in the cartoons and take the umbrella up on the top of the garage and jump off, that's what I'm going to do. Erickson says a child who is given too much autonomy can become impulsive and not care for their actions. And so the angel appears to Joseph and says, I know you're confused. I know you're unhappy with this. I know this doesn't make any sense, but stay with Mary. Help her out. She's going to have a son, and on top of everything else, God's already picked out his name for you. For you. Uh, his name is going to be Jesus. And so, uh, you know, Joseph maybe thinking to himself, oh, well, you know, we were going to name him Carson with a Y and a silent Z and an ampersand in there and have it be a really unique name that everybody will recognize. But instead, God says, give him this plain, ordinary name of Jesus. Many of you are aware that Jesus is the Greek version of the name. In the Hebrew, it would have been Yeshua or Joshua. And there's a reason why God says you have to name this child Jesus, and that's because the name literally means Yahweh, or God delivers, God saves. In other words, there's a very important message being sent here about who Jesus is and why his presence on earth is important. Uh, the angel says you will name him. The word here in the Greek, onoma, means authority. It means character. It means reputation. In other words, it's not just a name. It's not just a cool sounding name. It's not just my grandpa's name, it is something much more than that. Jack Hayford explains it, and he says, In the ancient world, one's name signified not only the person's identity, but their inherent character. Do you see what's happening here? This baby is going to be born in fulfillment of the prophecy, and you're going to name him Jesus. Why do you name him Jesus? Because it means Yahweh delivers. John, in his gospel, talks about this further, and he says, These things are written, all of this, that's been laid out for you is written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in Him, you will have life. How? By the power of His authority, His character, His reputation. You see, Joseph's example reminds us that doing things our way and doing things God's way both cost us something. We sometimes do the math in our minds and decide God's way is going to cost too much. I'm going to do it my way. The reality is you always pay at the end. We can have the courage to make the right choice.
because God is who he has always claimed to be, and he will keep his promises. His name is good. Dietrich Bonhoeffer puts it this way. He says, no one can say yes to God's ways who has said no to his promises and commandments. Acceptance of the will of God comes in the daily submission under his word. Joseph was not a righteous man by accident. Joseph was a righteous man because he studied God's word, because he was obedient to God's voice, because he had worked through those levels of reasoning and had arrived at maturity. Philippians 2 verse 9 talks about the importance of this name issue and it says that God gave Jesus the name above all other names that at his name every knee should bow. Our second key point is that courage is sustained by reminding ourselves that our way is not the best way. No matter how good it looks, it's not the best way. As we submit to God's authority, the strength to obey is sure to follow. So, the courage to be disdained, the courage to give up my way, finally the courage to acknowledge sin. He says you're to name this child Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. In 2004, Matt Emmons was on the precipice of achieving something he had been working very hard for for many years. He was at the Olympics in Greece, in Athens, Greece, and he was in the final round of the shooting competition. And going into that final round, Emmons had a comfortable lead. And all he had to do was hit the target reasonably well one time, and the gold medal would be his. And so he sighted down the target in his scope. He breathed in and out like he had been trained to do so many times, and he fired. And through his scope, he could see that he hit the bullseye. And he turned around and triumphed and raised his fist and began to celebrate. And he looked back at his teammates and noticed that nobody else was celebrating. Their heads were all down. And much to his dismay, Emmons discovered that he had indeed hit a bullseye but he had hit the bullseye on his opponent's target. And as a result, he got a score of zero, and he dropped from first place to eighth place and lost his chance at a gold medal. This is a turning point for Emmons. He could have said, I worked so hard for this. I quit. I'm walking away. I will never do this again. Uh, but something happened. Emmons went to a bar in uh, the Olympic Village, and he was uh, drowning his sorrows and a beautiful young woman from the Czech Republic shooting team came up to him and consoled him and said how sorry she was and how much she admired how he had handled the disappointment and her name was Katie and he and Katie began to spend time together and over the next few years uh, they got closer and closer and they ended up getting married and not only did they get married but Emmons continued to shoot and in fact he earned in that Olympics three other medals he went on to the next Olympics in 2008 and medal there as well. And reflecting on this amazing, amazingly embarrassing faux pas that he made in front of the rest of the world in an interview, Emmett says this, had I not made that mistake, maybe I retire from shooting. Maybe I don't marry Katie. I wouldn't change a thing. Emmett was able to acknowledge that he had missed the mark and he was able to move forward from it in a productive way. This is the assurance that Christ's life and death and resurrection give to us. We all have sin. The Greek word here, hamartia, means failure. It means forfeiture. It is an actual sports word from the archery world in that time, which meant missing the mark, missing the bullseye. You see this word used in 1 John 1, 9, where we're told if we confess our hamartia, we confess that we have missed the mark to God, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our wickedness. James Ryrie says something interesting here, which I think ties into our narrative, which is that sin or hamartia is not only a negative idea, but it includes the positive idea of hitting the wrong mark. So what he tells us in this passage is you can, on one hand, sin by going the complete opposite direction, or you can go in another direction and still sin because you chase after the wrong things. You succeed at things in life that don't really matter. And the beauty of Joseph's story is that he recognizes this is the target. This is what it means to hit the mark. Joseph's example reminds us that sin is just as much about pursuing the wrong goals in life as it is about failure to keep God's commandments. Our only hope for removing sin from our lives is the acceptance of the grace that comes with owning our sin. Martin Luther puts it this way. He says, we are sinners according to the law. 
The true way to Christianity is first to acknowledge that we are sinners according to the law and that it is impossible for us to do anything good. Therefore, you cannot earn grace by what you do, and if you try, you double your offense. For since you are a bad tree, you can only produce bad fruit, that is, sin. This is further illustrated as Jesus comes and he explains why he was sent, why he came to be born in that manger, why he was on earth. He says, I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but instead those who know they are sinners and need to repent. Our last key point is that courage achieves its ultimate purpose when we begin to see ourselves for who we really are. When we do this, we unleash the power of God's grace and we begin to change from within. Three questions to ask yourself as we move into another week. Question number one, who am I most concerned with pleasing? Is it the people around me or is it God? Number two, which way of doing things am I going to choose? Am I going to choose what seems like the easy way, the way that's not going to cost me anything, or am I willing to accept the costs of discipleship, the cost of following Christ, and trust that he will make it all right in the end? And then lastly, have I come to grips with my sinful nature? Can I admit that I've either missed the mark altogether or I have hit the bullseye on the wrong target and I'm ready to start moving the direction that I need to? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your mercy, for your kindness in sending your son uh, at a time when none of us deserve it. Uh, Father, we ask that you would give us the wisdom and the courage that we need to not only follow you, uh, but to be faithful during the ups and downs of our journey here in this world. Uh, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.